AI, working on research and development of general intelligence layers for robotics. And he's going to talk about a detailed computational model of thalamic and cortical microcircuits based on inference in a generative vision model. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ulrich. Uh, and it's uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present. This is going to be a very different kind of talk. Uh, it's not really a circuit level talk. Uh, and it's mostly going to be an infomercial for this preprint that we have on BioArchive. I'll just give you the overall motivation and some key results from that uh, paper. Um, so uh, the question that we are after is, uh, how can we understand visual cortical uh, circuits? By understand, we, me uh, we mean, we should be able to answer all these questions. What is the function of a cortical column? What computations are performed in different laminae? What is the computational role of clonal neurons? Which connections in a cortical column are innate? What, why are feedback uh, connections there? What's the computational role of thalamus? All these things that we are uh, interested in and we should be able to assign precise roles for each of them. That's, that's our goal. Now, um, of course, you can bottom up study the circuits. Uh, they provide very important clues in neurophysiology and modeling, et cetera. But the computational model will be too local. Uh, it will be very hard to connect it to the overall behavior of vision, you know, recognizing objects, parsing, uh, et cetera. Uh, you can do connectomes, but connectomes themselves are not very informative. Uh, you cannot just connect, um, hope to simulate a connectome and get computational insights out of it. There's a connectome is not going to start working like the visual cortex. Uh, um, so, so, it, so how do you attack this uh, problem? So we have a different methodology. We, we, we call it the triangulation strategy. The trick is to look at the brain, the world and computation at the same time. And, and the brain is um, you know, cognitive science and neuroscience uh, is giving us um, a lot of insights about how the brain is organized, what the brain does, what are the, some, some of the organizational principles. And if you can connect it to the organization of the world uh, and connect it to real world test sets, then you're finding something informative there. And of course, those uh, have to be formulated in terms of computational and algorithmic models. And you should be able to come to reasons on why these structures exist uh, from an algorithmic angle. Uh, and, and when you can connect all three vertices of the triangle for, a, for, for an organizational feature in the brain, that's when you have found something uh, useful uh, algorithm-wise. Um, so if you, for example, if you ignore the world vertex, um, then, you know, you, then you don't address the overall task uh, of vision in solving the problem. If you ignore the brain vertex, that is just pure machine learning and statistics, uh, you don't, Take any insights from the brain, and of course, you cannot tell anything about the brain. And uh, if you ignore the computational vertex, then you can make local uh, things, but it's very hard to build large models. Um, so the first step in our approach was to take insights from the brain and build a computational model, an algorithmic model, so that that um, model can stand on its own. Although it uses insights from the brain, it is purely specified as a uh, computational and algorithmic model. And this is a generative vision model that we published in science in uh, 2017. It got a good amount of attention because this was also used to break captchas, uh, fundamentally break the difference of text-based captchas using this generative model. And it is uh, much more data efficient than uh, deep neural networks. And one, one key differentiator is that it uses feedback and lateral connections to explain a scene of characters rather than just doing pattern recognition feed forward. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, we have uh, lots of details on what, what, what were the computational feature, how it is connected to representation in RC and, uh, and you know, uh, what, what is the computational uh, algorithmic reason for that? For example, you know, I, I'm just taking one row from here, the top row, blobs and interblobs is an organizational feature that we see in the visual cortex. And it is connected to the algorithmic principle of separately representing contours and surfaces, uh, and, uh, and, and that is suitable for representing natural signals. Um, so just, just to give you a flavor of how we, how we think about these uh, ideas. Uh, and um, now this paper, this preprint that I talked about is working backward from there. We are basically taking, take this computational model, can we find out how we can be implemented in biology? And of course, then it will be filling in a lot of details that biology did not predict. You will be using a lot of biological data in coming up with that instantiation, but, but it will also be predicting a lot of the details because the computational model is kind of complete uh, and it will fill in the details that biology did not predict. Um, 
So that is uh, this preprint that we put on. Uh, and um, so I can, I can just give you an illustration of how this works. The computational model is a graphical model. It's a probabilistic graphical model, which can be also represented as a factor graph. And then from that factor graph, we are deriving a neural implementation. And even for a simple uh, graphical model. So here in A, you have a very simple graphical model, which is uh, features ABC connecting to pixels. It's basically saying these features represent, uh, these lines generate these pixels. And it is represented in the factor graph form in uh, panel B. Well, keep in mind that this is a graphical model. That means every link is a bidirectional interaction. Uh, so that means if you want to implement this in biology, you need a lot more neurons than a, you know, a node is expanded into multiple neurons because they have to communicate messages uh, in one direction and in the other direction. And you have to also compute the belief of that node. Uh, you know, what does that node believe in? Should I be on or off? That has to be represented in a separate neuron, which is different from the neuron that is receiving messages. So, um, and, and then even this simple circuit um, can produce a lot of, so this is on um, panel E, you see the implementation of the circuit and it can produce a lot of inhibition excitation uh, effects based on context, very nonlinear interactions. But you know we are not hard coding in that nonlinear interactions. It is coming from the factor graph. Um, but you can it can produce many of these gating mechanisms we we see in the brain. This is, for example, maps to some of the gating mechanisms in thalamus. Um, and uh, of course, the factor graph for RCN uh, is much more complex. It has some of the properties of a convolutional neural networks, but it is generative and it has more things. For example, it also runs in the backward direction. So it has features, ladders, and pools, but keep in mind that all these thing connections are bidirectional. So the, the interactions are both ways. Um, so when you map that to cortical circuit, it will, oh, and of course, each of these factors have their own equations associated with them. And when you map that to cortical circuits, this is what it looks like um, you know, based on our mapping. Of course, this is using information from biology uh, to figure out how this maps onto cortical uh, laminae and columns. And one one key thing to keep in mind is that you know the circuit looks like this kind of you kind of need two copies of that circuit because um, you need to have feed forward messages and feedback messages and and their beliefs to be uh, combined. And similarly, lateral messages also need to keep two copies. And and some portion of this mapping when two levels interact. Uh, when V1 interacts with V2, there has to be some explaining away computation between them. By explaining away, I mean when when a uh, pixel is being claimed by two higher level features, um, you need to have competition between them. It, this ha happens naturally in a probabilistic graphical model, and um, and this competition can be thought of as gating. Uh, for example, if attention turns on one feature, you need to turn off the other feature. So that that gating function, which naturally happens in the probabilistic graphical model, when we looked at the anatomy and physiology, it, it the, the only way it can fit naturally is in the in the thalamus, and it predicts the circuits of the thalamus to uh, to a striking uh, degree, uh, which was pretty um, interesting to see for us. And one conceptual thing that you might want to take away from this uh, this whole thing is that you can think of a micro column as, as a random variable, as a, as a feature, for example, and the, the column itself is representing this feature, but the different laminae in the column are representing different aspects of this feature. For example, how does this feature participate in a higher level feature? How does that feature participate in different lateral contexts? How does it feature participate or unfold into uh, lower level uh, components, and and finally, how do you combine information from feed, feed forward, feedback, and lateral to produce the belief of the of the uh, micro column? Um, and uh, here is what I mentioned about the thalamus uh, circuits. You 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 know if you uh, study Sherman and uh, Guillory uh, papers, you know that there is a feed forward pathway from uh, you know different regions that goes through the thalamus with the gating involved and. And this is very much predicted by our uh, mapping from RCN to uh, cortical circuits, including to the details of the, um, the the gating circuit and the dynamics which I showed earlier. And also predicts um, interactions between blobs and inner blobs. Um, and another thing that you can do is you can actually do virtual neurophysiology, you know, because now what you can what you have is a functional 
in a circuit which which does recognition segmentation etc and so you can actually do virtual neurophysiology so you can simulate things like subjective contour effects where you you are given this um, uh, illusions where but you see contours where it doesn't exist for example all the magenta portions of these contours are hallucinated um, by uh, your brain and also by our our system and you can also study the dynamics of that on you know which layer uh, of the cortex will turn on and turn off at what time during the inference of this subjective contour effect and um, you can also do that for uh, things that have a combination of subjective contour effect and uh, surface uh, models for example neon color spreading where the boundaries are hallucinated and also the color is hallucinated you you can uh, in our system for example replicate many of the things that are observed in biology where uh, the feedback computation first settles for the contours and then uh, the contours kind of act as boundary for filling in the surface information and that is why the the color uh, settles later uh, and and you, the the outer color kind of bleeds into the uh, inner inner segments um so that's basically uh, what i wanted to convey um that's just a very brief summary of um, a, a pretty uh, lengthy and detailed paper um you can you can find out more about uh, our work at ivicarious.com uh and you can always follow me at uh, dilip learning uh, on twitter um uh, to get uh, more uh, updates and more information thank you for listening thank you um that's some very exciting stuff definitely um i think there's a lot of information there that that's very hard to press into a 12 minute talk but uh, i i appreciate yeah. <laughs> that you tried definitely <laughs> um Let's see, there's a question in the Q&A from Gonzalo uh, saying, very nice talk. Does the implementation of learning in the model in neural circuits require plasticity at all synapses or is plasticity restricted to few layers and locations? Yes, uh, and in fact, um, very good question. That is another prediction from the model. Um, so all the, all the synapses are not equally plastic. In fact, some synapses are not plastic at all. And and one one thing to take away from it uh, is that most of the vertical connections within a column can be pre-established, except maybe connections to layer four, which kind of comes from the other region that cannot be pre-established. But many other connections within a uh, within a cortical column, the vertical inner laminar connections can be pre-established and uh, you know just programmed genetically in. And it a lot of the synaptic plasticity is on the lateral connections, the, the inner column uh, connections, and that's predicted by the model. So how, how does the the, the so it, the plasticity is is that somewhat close to realistic plasticity or uh, we don't make strong statements about that <laughs> we haven't studied that in detail so yeah we don't no. we don't uh, uh, worry too much about the biological plausibility of the learning algorithms but uh, this this one is looking at mostly from the inference side but it can make predictions about okay these are the connections that need to be plastic okay. So a follow up question from Gonzalo he asks uh, so that should come out in connectomes right um that well depends on whether you are modeling the connectome of uh, an infant or you know near, <laughs> uh, whether it's in the fetus or you know later because some of these connections get established as part of development right so in the, in a fully developed cortex you might not see a difference in a, in a static connectome you might have to see the variation in the connectome with time. Okay, we also have a question from Joseph. Uh, he says, very good talk. I would like to know if this predicts saccade suppression. Um, no, not this one, because um, currently the model, uh, the computational model is about recognizing a single snapshot. Uh, it, 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 can, it can deal with a scene, parsing a scene, uh, but the computational model does not do anything which in, includes saccades. Although we have internally worked on a computational model that includes saccades, etc. But you know that we haven't uh, one published that computational model or tried to map that to biology. But you know we are, we are basically we are working in the forward direction where we are taking insights from biology and building the computational model. That's a that's the state we are in. And once we are done with that, we'll of course come back. But it will be another two years. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward to you coming back in two years and, and telling us about that. <laughs> That's <laughs> brilliant. Thank you very much, Dave.